disparities in uh, how this disease is affecting, um, you know, both uh, African Americans and Hispanic uh, uh, populations, and and hopefully dispel a rumor that it's not that they're necessarily more susceptible that they're um, you know, the rates of obesity, hypertension, and some of these other uh, Comorbid. comorbidities are, in, are higher in that in those populations. The places where they've been more adversely affected, they're more densely populated, and they have, I, you know, we all know they have less access to health care, um, yeah. both maintenance health care. So I don't want folks listening to think that they're necessarily more susceptible. Um, I don't think this virus discriminates that much. We honestly don't know the denominator. We, as you pointed out, we don't know how many asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic folks are out there who actually have had the disease or who are carrying it. And that's the whole re rationale for social distancing. Um, but they are uh, disproportionately affected should they get disease. Yeah. So uh, and I, and I, I, and I think that's an important distinction rather than to say that blacks or Hispanics are, are at a higher risk to get the disease. Correct. Correct. Uh, you know, and and there's other things that that go along with it. Uh, you know, the, we had someone um, uh, that was talking about uh, uh, the impact on uh, African Americans, which is a big problem here in uh, Chicago uh, with this disease, and, and it also has to do with um, there's more uh, uh, essential workers that are African American doing certain jobs that are directly uh, facing out to the public, and so that also uh, contributes to uh, probably increased. Uh, likelihood that they're getting exposed. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not fair. And it's one of the reasons where we're seeing a high amount of disease in Detroit and Chicago and Louisiana, um, in addition to New York. So Mike, I found this really interesting graph. I should have sent it to Dan, but I didn't. Um, it was a routers uh, graph and they, they showed MERS, SARS and the coronavirus. And for every 50 people that were infected, 17 MERS died, five people with SARS died, and one person with coronavirus died. I thought that was so interesting because the fatality, when you compare the three, coronavirus is much less, but the, um, the communicable part, the disease, the, um, how catchy it is, you know, how fast it spreads is way off the chart compared to the other two. So yeah, I, think, I, think, I think part of that too is that if you look at, at the clinical course of disease, it's very different. So almost all patients with uh, SARS and MERS had symptomatic disease, whereas we know that there's a sizable proportion of asymptomatic patients. Mm -hmm. So that just facilitates kind of silent uh, uh, transmission. Um, the, the other uh, thing that uh, is uh, really important to, to recognize um, is that uh, the time frame was also different. When people got infected to when they got sick, was just a matter of days, whereas for this, it's almost a week before people start getting sick. And so if you add to the fact that they have this longer incubation period till they're clinically uh, symptomatic, added to a larger asymptomatic uh, proportion of the disease, you're able to spread the disease much more quickly. And, con uh, and also, it's much harder to get control of this virus uh, uh, for it. And then thankfully, the mortality is much lower than those viruses because if it was at the SARS, uh, which is about 9% mortality, and MERS, which was 30% mortality, um, we'd be talking about a very different uh, situation. Um, so Mike, we have a, a basic question here. Um, is social distancing really working and should we stay the course? When do you think life's gonna return back to normal? Again, we're gonna have the questions at the end too, but yeah. some are just popping up now, so we might as well just go with yeah. it. Well, what I would say is social distancing is, is definitely working. So if you look at the original uh, uh, case estimates, uh, we were talking about 100 million patients. And granted, we've got still another month to go, but our current uh, global uh, uh, number of cases is just over 2 million. In the United States, 636,000. So far less than the 100 million that we would have been expecting just for the United States alone. Likewise, mortality is instead of being you know one to two million people, is going to be closer to the you know thirty to fifty to eighty million. So what we're do what we've done is it's working. It, we're we're having uh, much less of an impact. And thankfully, that what we really wanted to accomplish is that the hospitals aren't being overwhelmed. They were in New York. Thankfully, so far, 
um, here in Chicago, things are under control um, and uh, we're able to, to control. Um, when yep. will life re return to normal? That's the million dollar question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the big challenge is, is uh, uh, since we flatten the curve, it also means that things are gonna splay out. Um, so I suspect um, we're gonna see a lot of uh, disease and probably have an impact on our lives um, uh, for most areas through much of May. Um, it's gonna be very different for different parts of the, the uh, country. If you're in a more rural area where there's, it's easier to social distance, um, it, it may be something where you can get to, to uh, uh, back normal sooner. Here in a big city, it's gonna be a lot harder. So Mike, I just, I think, I know what you meant because Mike and I worked together for nine years. I, I think you slipped out a number there about deaths in the millions and right now, even worldwide, we're talking about 100,000, 133,000 deaths. So um, we're blessed. We think that the impact of the fatality, case fatality rate is gonna be far less than we had feared initially. Yeah. And I don't want people walking away from this um, this chat thinking that there are gonna be millions of deaths. I, I think he was talking about the model that was projected yeah, early on. Sure. Um, so um, I have, oh, so how are things looking in Chicago? And, um, you know, were you worried at any point that that might be the next New York, the United States, uh, large city? And yeah, I, I, I definitely would say if you looked at, um, so, so we truly had exponential growth of cases uh, as of about a week ago, and pretty much everyone was very worried that as of last weekend, um, when we were hit a point where we would basically max out our hospital. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, that hasn't been the case. We have uh, plenty of ICU beds, plenty of uh, hospital beds to take care of patients. Um, some of the smaller hospitals are having a hard time uh, keeping up, uh, but for the most part, we're, we're pretty lucky that uh, we've got uh, good capacity. And, uh, you know, our mayor's done a great job, too, of uh, reinforcing stay at home. There was there was a funny meme with your with your mayor, and um, it was on Easter Sunday, and Jesus was trying to come out of the tomb. He rose from the dead, and she was standing there, and she's like, no. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious <laughs> with a very stern, you know, face. It was It was so funny. But um, all right, so we're gonna give you a break, but jump in anytime. And um, we're gonna let Mac take over a little bit. And again, we have a bunch of questions for you at the end as well. Okay. And um, yeah, so Mac, um, you're gonna fill us in with what's going on at UW. There's some great things going on at many hospitals across the country. We're so excited about um, wonderful things, you know, t as far as testing and equipment and such. Um, but uh, we thought we'd, bring this home and you can talk about what you're doing. And we even have a couple of pictures of Mac with his <laughs> PPE on that Dan's gonna pull up in a second. Well, uh, you know, uh, A, we're very proud of the collaborative efforts that have gone into the planning uh, that we've been fortunate enough to have the time to do here in Wisconsin. So that we've been able to, uh, with social media and the way we're all connected around the world now, um, learn from our colleagues. Uh, we literally, between all the WhatsApp group, chat groups and things that uh, we're all in professionally, we can really share experiences around the globe, which has been fantastic. Within the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, environment. Here's um, what I found. We've been very happy uh, to have these collaborations with our engineers who uh, immediately went out with very little, uh, you know, provocation uh, and started to 3D print face shields for all of us. They've even gone on to modify the face shields we use in the operating room that uh, allow us to use our magnifying surgical loops and our headlights and our microscopes, uh, but still allow us to uh, protect ourselves and, and our operative teams. Um, so we're, we're very grateful for the, the you know, the, the whole group of, of folks in academia who really come to the to, to the rescue. And this isn't just happening here in Wisconsin, it's happening across the country, but I've been a personal benefactor of what's going on here. Um, we do have some pictures. You, you guys hear all the time about PPE and you see pictures uh, on the news. Um, I, I don't know if Dan, Dan can put Dan up. Dan can show you so, the picture. All right, the so photo have, of the day. So we have uh, a standard PPE. That's my N95 respirator. That's uh, my, my mask that I get to keep now and use every day for anybody who's either uh, COVID positive or a person under uh, investigation. 
it's an incredibly uncomfortable thing to to wear all the time uh, because it's designed to prevent transmission of very small particles to and from uh, my respiratory tract to others and other people's to me. Um, but it creates muffled voices and mumbling and it's challenging to understand. And I can guarantee you operating for three or four hours with one of those on is not a lot of fun. Now you can see the face shield, they all look the same now. Uh, that's the problem with 3D printing. They, they're excellent at producing exactly the same thing. So we have to put our names on everything. We carry around plastic and paper bags that we carry these things in between cases and wipe them down and trying to preserve PPE because that's been the biggest issue uh, for us and for what happened to our colleagues in New York places in Italy that got overrun is that they quickly ran out of PPE and that puts the healthcare workers at risk. And then you have the healthcare workers getting sick. And so you have a double whammy of socially, uh, uh, socially disseminated disease with uh, exponential growth of patients showing up at the healthcare facility and exponential decline in available qualified people to take care of them. So we've been fortunate to be able to uh, use our PPE uh, carefully and not, not exhaust it. And with the flattening of the curve, we're quite comfortable now that we're going to have enough to go around um, to, to take care of the patients that need us um, for the weeks and a couple of months, I'm afraid, to come. I have a comment. So um, these masks were made by the UW engineers and they sent the, the, face, um, shields. the face shields, I'm sorry. Um, and they sent this design all over globally. It's just so cool how people are coming together to um, you know, work on these. Um, I have a question for you. So you have your N95 mask on, you have glasses on that's protecting your eyes. Why, why would you wear a face shield? Um, well, you can have splash and splatter um, that, can go in and around things. So especially if this is what we would wear in surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it's basic protection. Uh, and folks that don't wear eye, you know, glasses, you know, I wear glasses so I can see straight. Other people don't need to wear glasses or wear contacts. We can talk about contacts in a minute. Mike might have some opinions about that because that gets you touching your eyes, which is another way of infecting yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, the face shield is, you know, it originated with OSHA and things like that to protect us not only full face, but on the side. So this wraps around and all the way back to our ears to, to keep us from getting splashed. Does it also prevent you from touching your face? After you know, it, it makes it, yeah, it, it reminds you not to touch your face, yeah. but in surgery, you know, over time you learn not to reach up and touch your face because you're supposed to be maintaining sterility. Um, now that uh, the, the other thing that has been uh, helpful in us preserving PPE is the ability to test and um, the, the way that, that we've been able to stand up rapid testing around the country. Um, and that's got a whole interesting timeline that maybe some other time we could get into in terms of initially we had to use, uh, you know, the WHO or the CDC guidelines and this was only available in the state labs and there was minimal reagents and it took three days to get results. And that clearly wasn't going to be an adequate way to respond to the overwhelming patient load so that uh, the regulations were changed and institutions were allowed to come up with their own testing uh, platforms. Um, and and University of Wisconsin was one of those places that came up with that. And we were able to institute testing um, within a couple of weeks on our own um, and then increase the throughput of that testing. Um, we had initially just uh, a, a system that you had to have at least 30 uh, tests ready to go. You could, it was a single plate. You had to fill all 30 wells in the plate, and then you could run the test. Um, and there was a 12 to 8, 16, 18-hour turnaround. Now we uh, uh, have single uh, ability to test uh, patients even quicker uh, with uh, a turnaround time of six to eight hours. And, and now even in the last two days, we've been able to come up with some point of care testing. There are two products out there that are, these are all PCR tests that look for actual viral RNA in the sample from the nasopharynx. And Mike's more of an expert about that than I, but uh, um, it detects a single strand of, uh, of RNA. Uh, so it'll detect uh, patients that have a viral load in their nasopharynx. And now with these point of care tests, we can do this, for example, in an emergency room get an answer in 45 minutes. And if you need an emergency operation, then we know whether we need to wear that PPE or not. In the last three weeks prior to this, we just wore PPE 
uh, presumptively, and we're consuming a lot of PPE in that situation. So now that we know, uh, it's it's nicer for the surgeon and and the whole surgical team if we know they're COVID negative in the emergency room that it, we can wear our standard protective stuff and not start to consume this valuable resource. Same issue applies to ventilators. By flattening the curve, we've been able to avoid the, the rash of patients that need to go on to mechanical ventilation. And as Mike showed some of the slides, we think we have the capacity to weather the storm. The problem is the storm's gonna last for several more weeks before we're on the backside of this. But we're gonna get through this. We are gonna get through this. We had a question come in actually that yeah. got texted to me, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, I just think it's pretty, pretty valid, you know, or interesting. Uh, but for you guys, um, what is the most, uh, sorry, what is the most surprising, like, fact about this particular virus in your guys' like medical histories? What's the most surprising one uh, that you guys have seen? Or like the most surprising part of it? I'll say from my standpoint, I think the thing that uh, is the biggest surprise is how everyone, at least in the medical world, and I think it's true everywhere, is absolutely focused on fighting this. And so, you know, I think as Mac was talking about, you have, uh, you know, the engineers and the people in print things. I don't know how to do that, but they're figuring out solutions for this. We have, I have calls every day from urologists and whatnot that have ideas about how to, to uh, be creative and, and solve real-time problems. Uh, I, I think that's been uh, really exciting to see. I have to uh, echo Mike's sentiments there. We, we very quickly, because of social distancing, shut, shut down research and, and all the things going on in the university, yet a lot of these researchers had laboratories that worked on RNA and DNA and had reagents that we were lacking to be able to do more testing. And overnight, we would have, you know, cartons of reagents delivered to the clinical lab to be used to allow us to increase the throughput of testing. So it was quite amazing how people pitched in and even the community was reaching out to ask people to make make masks or provide you know, daycare for the healthcare workers. So it was really uh, quite amazing to see how all walks of life pitched in. On the, the medicine side, um, talking to my, my peers that are on the front lines in the ICU. When these patients get really sick in the ICU, they get really sick in a hurry. And, uh, you know, it's it's not, it's a little bit different, the pace of their decline than what we're used to seeing with other forms of um, something called ARDS, the Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Um, the, the COVID patients decline in a big hurry. So we've had to stand up ICU teams uh, that have enough capacity to deal with a lot of sick patients in a hurry. And then do you want to talk about the really quick, the UW? Uh, yeah, and, and Mike, Mike will, be, uh, will weigh in on this. Um, he talked a little bit about vaccine, and a vaccine's, uh, you know, I think arguably a year away. And um, it's hard to figure out how to raise the vaccine that's going to be truly effective. Um, I've had two of my... my uh, uh, colleagues who've had the disease and have recovered, fortunately. Um, and, you know, I jokingly said, I want some of your plasma, like tomorrow, um, <laughs> to make me feel safe and uh, to go into the hospital. But UW is part of a multi-institutional uh, uh, clinical trial using convalescent plasma from coronavirus uh, patients who've recovered um, in a collaboration between all these institutions and the Red Cross um, to give this convalescent plasma as a as you know therapy because presumably this convalescent plasma has the actual antibodies neutralizing antibodies that would be potentially the most effective therapy uh, so I, I i'm going to get out on the thin ice if i keep going on that i'm gonna let mike who knows a lot more about this stuff talk no so, no no. i i think I, it, it's really important we're, we're involved in that uh that uh, study as well here at northwestern the big challenge that we're having is, is that um so there's a requirement. So people have to be 28 days recovered mm -hmm. before they can donate the plasma. And so, you know, if you think about that, we're about three weeks or so into the kind of the big bloom of uh, patients we saw in the United States. There aren't a lot of people that have fully recovered. Um, but I think if you have, like, if you're watching this and, and you had COVID-19 and have recovered, 
I, I think the, the best thing you can do if you want to help is to uh, look on the, the website uh, for the American Red Cross or your local blood bank, and mm -hmm. uh, they will have information about how to uh, donate plasma. And then while I'm plugging that, there's a need for all the blood products. Oh, uh, there, there aren't uh, as many people going uh, to get blood drawn. They're set up so that they're safe. Uh, you're not going to get COVID by donating blood, um, yeah. but it's going to help multiple people by, by doing so. And like I said, the plasma will, will help, and I think is now one of the, the most promising therapies. For and that's awesome. And if we are able to develop testing that we can use more widely, we may find that there are a lot of minimally or asymptomatic patients that have convalescent plasma and don't even realize it. So uh, again, as we get through the rest of this year, we can scale up the ability to understand what the true denominator of infected people is. Um, I just saw UW looking for folks now to test to see if they've had it. Maybe they really don't know. Um, I'm not, I don't know if UW is, but there are studies out there where they are collecting samples. Mike just posted some today. Um, and there was an, another, um, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you with which university was collecting it. I think Fauci um, at the yeah. NIH is in, in yeah, NIH has, it, It's a very easy way to, to get it done. Um, if you just Google NIH convalescent serum, um, basically it'll take you to the website and the way that it works is you email them, they will reach out to you if they, they uh, uh, want to enroll you, they're picking people in different parts of the country at, at certain numbers. Um, if you get contacted, um, you read the consent form, you sign it, they mail you a, uh, a device, basically do a finger stick like you're checking your blood glucose, put it on a blotter, send it back to NIH, and then they'll tell you whether you're immune or not. That's awesome. And I can tell really? you, I just donated uh, blood a few weeks ago at the American two, Red Cross. Two weeks ago. And, uh, two weeks ago. And um, they do not test your blood for coronavirus. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why they're not doing that right now is you have to have symptoms. They're taking your, you know, to see if you have a fever and that sort of thing. But uh, back in the day when we had SARS and MERS, um, they would screen the patients the same way, and there was no transmission of those diseases when that was happening. But um, that's where we are today, and that's what's happening. They are now wearing masks. They weren't a couple weeks ago when, when I went. Um, and every two seconds, somebody in the US needs blood. So that's how desperate we are right now for blood. So if you're healthy, um, that's a super cool thing to do. But now we're just gonna kind of tune things down a bit and get a little less doctory, maybe a little more holistic and watch these two roll their eyes on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanna get back to um, your, your house, your home, your family. Um, and if you go to the CDC website, I mentioned this a little bit the last time we chatted, um, there's a, a defini definitions for methods <clears throat> of cleaning um, to reduce the risk of spreading infection. So when we clean surfaces, we're removing germs by using like soap, soap and water, and it kills some of the germs. Um, disinfecting, we kill germs on surfaces and objects, and we're using chemicals to kill those germs. And then sanitizing lowers the number of germs on surfaces and objects to a very safe level judged by um, pub public health standards, which means it kills 99.9% .9 of the germs. So um, there's certain products that will do this for us. Oh, I love that. Thank you for pulling that up. Um, if you go to CDC website, um, they'll shift you over to the um, Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone, some of these products, make sure you're reading labels because um, as soon as you use them on the surfaces, it doesn't mean that it instantly works. There's what they call a dwell time. So the products need to stay wet on these surfaces for a certain amount of time. So um, some of the approved um, products, and I'm not gonna name all of them. One of the best things to do is make your homemade bleach solution. Dominic, how much bleach per water? You should know this by heart now. <laughs> one third cup of bleach to one gallon of water. And let that um, solution sit on your surfaces um, for um, two minutes to kill germs. Now, as I'm saying this, bleach is not safe to use on every surface. So you don't want to trash your like fabrics and stuff like that. Again, read the labels what you can and cannot use on certain surfaces. Um, Lysol wipes take about four to 10 minutes. Clorox wipes, one to four minutes. Hydrogen peroxide, 3% undiluted um, on a surface will kill germs in a minute. 
Um, 70% alcohol, 30 seconds, no dilution. Um, and then there's a, a microban and a Purell multi-surface and those um, clean things pretty instantly, but obviously those are kind of hard to get right now. Some of the things to avoid, because there's a lot of myths out there and we just don't have enough evidence. Um, people were using um, vodka to make like hand sanitizer and to clean. Um, <laughs> vodka, even though it says it's 80% or 80% proof, yeah, percent proof no, 80 there's proof, 80 yes. proof. There's only 40% of actual alcohol in so, the product. So have, my dad was, my dad worked for a liquor company his whole life. So I learned early on that proof is, um, if you're 100 proof, it's 50% alcohol. If you're 80 proof, 40%. If you're 100, you know, 151, 75%. All right. So, so that'll work. Oh, did you guys? That'll be close to work. Camera, you guys started talking about booze, yeah. and I just. Right. Whoa. I mean, uh, the, but, the house is full now. We're yeah, it was, it was time for a toast at that point, I think. Right? Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, when you get to proof, you know, you cut proof in half, that's the alcohol content. Oh my gosh, 151. Do you remember like Harry Buffalo parties in college? Yeah. Right. Um, anyhow, um, so, so vodka's not going to work. Um, vinegar is not going to kill the coronavirus. Um, typically, vinegar is okay for some germs and washing produce, but not with this bug. Um, there's a lot of controversy out there right now about UV lamps, and there's just not enough evidence. And there's different types of UV lamps. You would need a UVC um, type of lamp to disinfect the air, and some hospitals use that to disinfect the air. Um, but uh, according to the WHO, um, UV rays are harmful to human skin cells, and um, we just don't have enough evidence. Um, saline solutions, not going to cut it. Um, just a reminder, areas to clean, you want to do high-touch areas, tabletops, countertops, doorknobs, light switches, keyboards, our cell phones, um, faucet handles, toilet, toilet handles. And if you're, when you're doing laundry, um, you know, Mike, I'm going to talk to you about this. Let me save this point for the end of this. Um, don't shake your laundry because there, if there is like any germs on there, you're just throwing it into the air um, and it will and release the virus. Before you clean um, it before you clean it, as you're getting it into the wash and dryer or ripping off the sheets of the bed, just kind of do it, you know, in a in a nice manner. Um, your water um, from your, uh, your hot water uh, and your dryer will kill the bugs. Um, our dryers heat up between 135 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and don't forget to wash your hands after you wash the clothes or, you know, put the dirty clothes in, in the washer and um, disinfect your long hamper. So you can do that by um, steaming, spraying with white salt products or, um, you know, just washing it down. Mike, um, the CDC had on it um, to wear gloves while you're washing clothes. And there's just so much controversy about people wearing gloves, especially grocery shopping and stuff, because the germs adhere to the gloves, and this is no offense to lay people because 30% of people that work in the hospital do not know how to don and doff um, isolation stuff. So putting on and off the gloves, mask down. They, they did a study, and 30% of the hospital folks even got it wrong. So I do want to ask you about that and, and not save that until the very end. Yeah, I, so I'm very anti-glove. Um, uh, for most people. It's great for us in the hospital. We do a good job of washing before and after putting the glove on. Whenever they get contaminated, we change, supposed to change the eye um, yeah. But, you know, I think the, the big thing is, is there's nothing magical about a glove that once you put it on, you're protected. It's, there's no difference between the glove and your skin. The one difference is, is that people think they're protected, so they're less careful they don't wash their hands as often uh, when they're wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I'm, I'm not a fan of gloves. Uh, I'm a fan of washing your hands. Um, uh, hand sanitizer uh, is great, the alcohol-based hand sanitizers. And again, there's a million recipes. Uh, Ken made our own Everclear and Aloe Gel. Um, um, and uh, you know that works great. Um, you can make as much of it again. Everclear wasn't was probably more expensive than rubbing alcohol, but uh, more available uh, and then <laughs> was, uh, easy, easy to get uh, as well. 
it's almost as good as the Purell. Um, and, uh, you know, it tastes better. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. And you can yeah. drink it. Uh, yeah. Although I don't recommend that. Um, um, so, so I think washing your hands is, is important. I think when washing your clothes, if they're your clothes, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not as worried. It's just more important. Put them in, wash your hands, and be done. Well, this poor guy doesn't stand a chance. He's not allowed to wear his shoes in the house. By the way, this bug can travel on shoes. And um, they went to areas of, of the hospital and um, swabbed um, pharmacy um, floors. And so there's no patients there at all, right? No positive patients there at all. And this stuff is traveling on shoes. So either have a designated room, like our laundry room, but this guy, since he goes back and forth to the hospital, they stay out in the garage. Um, True story. So, <laughs> and it was 32 this morning when I walked out in the garage in my stuff. <laughs> Oh. And he's only allowed to wear. He has one designated pair of shoes that he goes back and forth to work with. Everything else to put and away on lockdown. Then I change clothes in my office and go to see patients. So I don't bring anything clothes home, but I'm not allowed to do anything no. until I come home and change. This place is shut down. So this is how crazy I'm getting. So the best defense always is hand washing. Whether you're, it's it's your best defense. Whether you're grocery shopping, you know, trying to figure out if things are dirty or clean or whatever. Whenever you eat, cook, you know, what? just wash your hands. That's our best defense, right? We, we saw that lipid fat layer that encapsulates the virus. This busts through. It, you've seen uh, how dish soap um, goes through grease and like a butter dish, how you can clean a butter dish. Same thing. It will bust it through. It breaks up with the fat layer. Right. right. So then um, I've taken it a step further. We um, have an air purifier. If you want to know more about that, just, you know, I am me or something. Um, but it, it clears out not only cigarette smoke, pet dander, allergens, um, it gets rid of a lot of bacteria and viruses too. There's four different filters for that. And um, I also invested in, invested in a really cool steam cleaner. It's a great green way to uh, clean your house. The water heats up to 200 um, degrees Fahrenheit, and it's wonderful on um, wood floors, tile floors, showers, everything. Everything gets steamed around here. <laughs> Rugs, curtains, fabrics. You can even <laughs> clean your grill out in the backyard. It's got a lot of attachments and stuff, and I'm happy to tell you uh, more about that um, later. Um, and then um, I already told you about the laundry bin. Don't forget to make sure you're cleaning that and doing your um, laundry as frequent as, as possible. Um, there's controversy whether or not you should use um, a little bit of soap when you wash your produce. Um, I give my produce a bath and I just put a drop of soap in a tub of water and wash everything down. Um, if you have antibacterial soap or harsh soap, I wouldn't use that in your in bath. I use um, seventh generation. Um, that's personally what I'm doing here. I'm not making any <laughs> harsh recommendations. I don't want anyone to get sick. The FDA cannot endorse this uh, because, you know, it hasn't been tested for like human consumption. But if you just do a quick little bath, little rub, friction is great. Don't forget heat kills this virus too. And then a great rinse and then, you know, let it dry. Um, that's what we've been doing. Hey, you two shut up. I see you on the corner of my eye. <laughs> um, and then um, we have a lot of little free libraries. I wanted to ask you about this. This is on my mind. This, I, this is why I don't sleep at night. So they're really cute, these little houses, and they're all around the neighborhoods, and people are putting paper books in and out. And you know, It's a free like, lending library. Yeah. It's really cool and a great concept. But um, I'm thinking that should be shut down right now. We should probably not be sharing books. <laughs> What do you think about that? I know you think I'm crazy. No, 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 no. I would say there's no way to really clean the uh, uh, the books, so just leave them in the. You can you can uh, you pull out your Kindle, download the the, uh, the, right. the book, and uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, skip, skip some little, and then wipe down your keyboard. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm avoiding that stuff right now. And then the last thing I just wanted to touch base about um, is uh, a lot of people have professional house cleaners. So when um, house cleaners are allowed to come back into the environment and maybe we're doing a spring cleaning or something, uh, really do a thorough job of 
watching what type of equipment they use, ask what type of disinfectants they use. Are they sharing equipment between homes, vacuums and that sort of thing? Um, we are locking down here. <laughs> They're only gonna use my equipment. Nothing leaves, nothing enters. <laughs> but that's how, our, that's how, that's what we're doing. That's how PJ rolls, okay. <laughs> that's how I roll. Oh, yeah. I'm, more, I'm, I'm more afraid that they'll uh, uh, be sick and come in to the house. I'm yeah. not as worried about their, their cleaning supply. Um, so, so we've, for now, uh, unfortunately had our cleaning lady not come in. My cleaning lady is Ken, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm the cleaning lady here, yeah. <laughs> me, me and the steamer. All right, so um, now we're going to focus over to Dan and Dom um, to look at a little bit at pandemics and how they've um, impacted the housing economy. And we're going to touch base on that. And then after they're done, Mike, I have um, a list of questions um, to ask you. And then uh, we'll we'll kind of wrap things up. All right. Very, very cool. Sounds, sounds Thank you guys very really much for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. When and I and I'm pretty sure they can still. Will you guys nod your heads? Because I know Dom, you can't see them, but uh, will you still nod your heads if you can hear us? Okay. Yep. They can. So just FYI, if we make fun of them, they're they're there. They're there. Okay. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank um, you guys very much. That's awesome. I got text messages throughout the entire thing. We have. Surgeons from the West Coast all the way to cashiers on the East Coast. Every demographic covered on, on tonight, which is really cool. Neat. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. So thank so, you. Um, did you want to start things off? I think uh, the, I mean, you, you do you kind of have an idea where you want to take things first? I've got the some of the stats and some of the other slides too. So Yeah. So we had uh, just four things we wanted to show you guys uh, tonight as far as it impacts the real estate market. So um, and not necessarily tied to real estate. Most people are worried right now about uh, stocks and, and bonds and their portfolios. And then other people are worried about their second biggest asset, which is typically the, um, the home that they're living in or investment properties as well. So one of the things hyper local here that we're seeing in the, in the um, city of Madison, more specifically Dane County and our MLS is still the need for inventory and still the need for buyers. So as we closed out March, when this started to happen, um, we're still ahead of last year. We're anticipating the same thing for April and we're anticipating a, a, a later shift in the spring market um, this year. So we're anticipating uh, more uh, purchasing happening in the summer and the fall this year than, uh, than it typically would. So yeah, one of the things to know in regards to this as well is just that while the numbers of actual closings and everything are kind of relatively staying the same, uh, one of the things we can report internally uh, from over 115 agents, you know, showing a lot of houses, we do a couple thousand transactions a year and the showings are way down now. And one of the reasons, though, isn't because we have less people. The demand has stayed extremely high, um, but we don't the inventory that normally comes on in a rush in the spring because of simply this in our area, in addition to the fact that it is a cyclical market, um, it's a seasonal one. And of course, the the COVID virus has, has planted itself right in the middle of the spring market. The, uh, the positive to look in that uh, comment or in that little line, though, is that Builders are obviously uh, out building and um, they've, uh, you know, knock on wood and, you know, pray to whoever you pray to that they continue to get um, some decent weather and we don't get too many of those nasty storms like they had down south, um, you know, and everything else because we need buildable good days. But we are really um, looking at a lot of pent up demand, are we not? I mean, that's what we're hearing around uh around the horn so these numbers are likely to go up but the demand is still there so yeah and that's what we're continuing to see as well specific to dane county so when we look at our area we have a really good uh diverse workforce in dane county which i think is is continuing to show that demand um now when we expand it out to those other slides dan and we look sure. at the we look at the nationwide perspective. I took these slides and these statistics to try to align them to what's happening with um, what Mike was talking about earlier and Mac and PJ about the 
um, the SARS and the MERS. And yeah, then, I'll bring that one up first, and I do apologize. The uh, the gradient is going to be a little off, but we're you know as far as whatever, but it'll still be there. Cool. So if we look at that one, we can see 9/11, the SARS and the H1N1, and the impact on housing. And really, um, most people worry about housing because of what happened in 2008 and 2009, which um, is rightfully so. And when you look at the impact here, um, really no impact due to those. I think what you saw today in earnings, when we, if you're watching CNBC or any of the the earnings reports that came out, we had major banks report earnings today. I think we're seeing the steep dip, and Goldman and J.P. Morgan are are anticipating the same type of recovery, the best recovery we've ever had. So that's coming from the banks. That's not coming from any type of like political um, political slant on that. Well, and let's that, let's face it too, guys. Like one one thing that everybody focuses on in any sort of a crisis or any sort of like obvious negativity that comes in the media is the you know it's the the hyper focus on what's happening next versus what was happening leading up to this crisis and i think um that's really an important part of this conversation too is is everybody wants to say well last time or this last time or this last time well if you look back in history every every housing or financial downturn was predicated by some some things that were coming they were long standing coming and then like after the crisis they could point at those things and go see this was happening well we didn't have anything negative uh in in the lines of statistics happening before this virus hit so there isn't really a reason to say that other than the virus damage itself um which might be counteracted by a, an extreme amount of demand and we just don't know the uh, the amount of money that's out there is still quite high. So, and um, uh, did which uh, which one did you want after that? Sorry, go to, the, go to the one that shows the the spike in poor poor loans, and I think it's really important to tie that back to what's happening in the market right now. What banks are doing right now in the market, from an economic standpoint, is smart. It might not seem fair that you know standards are heightening and and credit is tightening in certain areas jp morgan's a big a big one their their standards and their um and, more and just because this will be hard for everybody to see on there or whatever this starts in june of 04 this is june of 08 all the way through today just to yeah. give everybody kind of a so when we pulled the statistics and we were talking to agents from multiple brokerages throughout the entire country um, on uh, Monday is when we got some of these statistics and we were talking about what's happening in different markets. Um, you know, housing bubble was due to bad loans. If you look at that today, the banks are reacting the way we need to react. Anyone who is maybe a low credit score buyer or someone who might be a low down payment buyer might have to wait. And that's the reality of the situation right now. We're in a market where we're fortunate enough, real estate is considered or deemed an essential position. Um, and we're still seeing lending happening. We're still seeing, um, you know, in our area specifically, um, that same demand there because the inventory has been so tight and Madison's a booming area. Yeah, I and can I mention something to you, Dom, since you touched yeah. on the fact that, that, that it's, it is an essential thing, because I do know there's already there is certain things going on too, like nobody would dare uh, shame the the great two doctors or nurse that that were just on speaking for continuing to do their profession or do their 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 industry uh, right now. But there is a little bit of that going on in ours, and it is a great opportunity for us to remind everybody that you know uh, we're not out slinging sales. Um, for our clients, uh, there are people that actually have to move and properties and homes too at their core are what we call shelter yep. so and shelter is the part that's the essential part so yeah I, just, I think that's i think that's critical that we take this opportunity to mention that because there are people in in our profession and colleagues of of of, of yours and mine that some are afraid to go out and do their job right now not because they're afraid of the virus they've already been trained on how to pretty much do this uh, with z almost zero human contact right up until we we have to. And even then, I think we can do it very safely. Um, and and yet they're worried. They're worried to go out because they're worried somebody's going to be like, why are you doing your job right now? You're going to get someone sick. And so yep. 
anyway. To Dan, I think Dan, to what your your point is, when we're talking to agents throughout the country, we're seeing that that you know markets that are hit really hard. Primary business there is not getting people into a home, or they're going to be homeless. Primary business in some of those markets is a high rental market. So because of how people are reacting as landlords to the rental market, people are able to extend leases and shelter in place. And I see one of the questions coming questions coming across the screen right now about oh, yeah. I think I think in our area it's it, we we don't have we don't have the uh, convenience of of letting people say hey you can't close on your home because then you have nowhere to go because of the ripple effects that that makes in our market specific to Madison because we aren't a high rental market like a New York City or a Chicago or a San Francisco. However, when um, there are smart ways to do it. So my clients that are in a high risk category and wanted to show, I've told them absolutely not. We're not doing it. It's not responsible to do that. My vacant homes, there's Clorox wipes, there's hand sanitizer, there's gloves, there's disposable booties, and there's a trash can by the door. So there are smart ways that we can continue to conduct business for people and at the same time, um, keep up with uh, making sure people have a place to go once they close. Don, I, think I want to be cognizant of our uh, live audience a little bit here too, because we had Josh Fisher, you know, he's like the data points on that. What is that last graph? And I just wanted to point out to everybody. So this is mortgage credit availability index. So, um, so everybody in there, everyone and their mother in 2008 and 2009, including private lenders had access to capital that was based off of ninja no income no job application and and could get credit for anything throughout the years as more accountability has been placed on the lender and low down payment programs have been placed on the lender we've been able to maintain high standards whether you have a low credit score with a low down payment or a high credit score with a high down payment and let me be real clear if they, we got any of our lender partners out there, that is not Dom blaming the lending situation on that. Not Lenders not. were forced into a, a, a must do competition uh, during that period of time as well. Um, it, and whatever, there was a lot of stuff going on back then. Now, what's the, the, the movie, The Big Short? Yeah, I love it. Uh, I thought it was a, I thought it was actually a pretty good depiction. Obviously there's still some Hollywood in there, but, I've got the uh, one more uh, slide here, Dom, with the unemployment rates. Did you want to touch on that real quick? The only thing to mention there is is we're going to see a spike in unemployment right now. That's inevitable. We're feeling it right now. Um, and again, that means that maybe buyers who are ready to buy now are going to have to wait 30, 60, 90, 120 days. There is no correlation with home values and the unemployment rate. That's all. Right on. Yeah, and I think uh, it, I would just love to share a personal story really quick. So I, 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 and I just thought it was at least a little interesting. Uh, I went over to the Pier One market to pick up mobile groceries in Monona there, and I pulled in and made my telephone call. And so the kid was coming out, and I called the kid because he was young. He told me um, I had my mask on, and he came out. He did not even have a mask on. Um, starts loading it in my car and I'm like, and I just, I said, I said, how are you doing? You know? And he said, good. And I, he goes, it's actually my first day doing this. I was a server over there, uh, at BW threes. And I was like, oh yeah. Okay. And he's like, yeah, I mean, everybody got canned. This is like the only job I could find. Two things I take out of that story. <laughs> Number one, he did not give it. I mean, he didn't, I, he obviously like that virus meant very little to him as far as the fear factor of him being out and being whatever. But I was really happy to see that he had gotten canned because of something and literally like took a job across the parking lot doing something completely different to, to, to go get a job. I mean, that was positive. So I don't know. I don't know. Hey, maybe and maybe should we we can let our we can let our, our you know the cool people back in if you guys have comments on anything too. We're done with our you know are we down are we done with our nerd section? Can we let the nerdy doctors back in? Yeah. That was awesome. we have a perfect balance right now of economic yeah. healthcare. It's perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that's right. Because that's, like, that's out of our yeah. wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's for ten minutes. It's great. That's right. Yeah. No, I mean this was this was really great. I think uh, you know if there's any. Uh, certainly any rumors I would like to dispel in, in 
both the financial world and everything else is that, you know, we're, everyone's going to look for blame later on this year. Sure. Uh, it's an election year on top of that. So um, if you use the social space to communicate with friends, family, or anything else this year, I would just really, really, my public service announcement for the night before we leave <laughs> is for you to really be cognizant of that between now and the election time. Do you really want to ruin a bunch of relationships when it's not the conversation between you that's wrong? It's not the relationship that's wrong. It's the platform that you're doing it on and it's the context of the arguments and it's the corruptness of our system. Well, so, especially when we're living with a, a life and death situation, right? Yeah, we need to get the politics out of this. Whoa, Whoa where'd we go? Where'd we go? You're yes. still there for us. I don't know. Are you right. guys? Are All you right. guys still there? Yeah. 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 Oh, this, is the this, is the this is one of those awesome, cool live Zoom moments too. All right. I can't. I can't see you guys at all. But um, you're still there. You. You look great. We can hear you. You guys are great. <laughs> no, I just said it's our computer is looking for an update right now. Uh, thank you. I, uh, thank you. And you know, I'm. I can't do this techie shit. So I. I <laughs> you're not reading it. Dan, I thought swear words were supposed to be filtered oh, out. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, YouTube. We did have, hey, YouTube. We did have hey. one more Facebook hey, question. Hey, you're back. You're back. Hey, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm let's, sorry. Let's, let's let's see real quick here. Oh. I don't. There's only. I don't. I know some of our streams. So I apologize to everybody out there in online world land. Some of our comments didn't uh, come through to us in this system from some of the different places. I'm going to go on and check the other Facebook feed really quick. But yeah, and they're asking if you have anything to ask of our panel or of anybody else. And certainly PJ or Michael, Doctor yeah. Doctor Michael. I call can I hate you know it's like when I was in the military. You can't really screw that stuff up much. You get burned up, but you guys don't seem to care. You guys are cool. No. We're um, Dan, um, there is, Dan, there is one more that came through um, from a, guy, a gentleman named John on Facebook. He said, there are political forces that are pushing for opening up the economy. It's about halfway up, Dan, if you want to throw that up. On yeah, we, I had that one come up a little bit earlier in there. Um, I'll put that on there. I think that's actually a, a worthwhile topic. We don't need to get too political, but it the is. Second um, part. The second you know, part. There are political forces that are pushing strong for opening, uh, up the economy. Uh, what what would be a strong indication that that would be safe in your well, I think that's a, let's avoid all politics and you know we did that last time too it just it can well, get I mean ugly. I think you but, could ask you could answer this in a medical way yeah let, no the let safety Michael part. take a stab yeah, at it and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts but the second half of the question is critical right okay. so so again I think the way that, the way that that I would think about it is um that you know, I showed you that graph in in Seattle when when the number of secondary transmissions gets below one, that's when I think it's uh, relatively safe to open. Whether you could open a little sooner than that uh, in some areas, I think sounds pretty reasonable. And that kind of data is available uh, in a relatively granular uh, bit of data. Uh, I think some of the things that have been also outlined, you know, making sure there's enough testing capacity, hospital mm -hmm. capacity, whatnot. So that if the numbers start going back up, you can recognize that and uh, uh, deal with it, I think are also critical components to any uh, decision. And I, I think <laughs> that most health I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Most Thank health, you. healthcare systems understand that this isn't a uh, black and white, yes, no, light switch decision to start the economy. It's not like we're going to go back to instantly where we used to be. And we may never go back to where we used to be. But there are clearly places, and you looked at Mike's heat map of places that are affected, and there's a lot of spaces that are disproportionately less affected that might be the safest place to, to cautiously restart, um, allow some businesses to get back into business, and, and, and see how we do. We have to do it in a cautious way, in a safe way, and monitor. So I'll give you a local example. Unfortunately, we had an election here last week and we all went to the polls. Yeah. And I think most of us in healthcare were ticked off about that decision. Um, there's no reason for politics to enter this viral thing. So we're all gonna be a little interested in what happens in another week or two when we get 10, 14 days beyond that to yeah. see what happens yeah. um, and whether we suffered you know, some 
bad consequences of a, uh, in my opinion, a, a stupid decision. No yeah. one was going to lose their job over whether we went to the polls that day or not. It was a primary election. So in any event, okay. um, enough politics. But yeah. the, the, at the end of the day, I'm going to steal the American Lung Association's tagline, but if you can't breathe, nothing matters. If you can't breathe, so, nothing matters. Um, you know, and that's not my line. That's their tagline now. Um, uh, but I'm a big supporter of the ALA. Um, so, I mean, we want to take care of each other and ourselves. So let's take, let's do that. Let's do it. Right. So, Mike, I have some questions here for you. So you're going to be back in the spotlight here. Okay. Um, why is this virus called a novel virus? Uh, so, so the reason why it's called novel is because it's it's new. It's not been seen before. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, new to everybody. Okay. And um, some of this stuff I'm pulling right off of some myths that may be spreading on social media. So even though some of these questions sound a little bit out there, it's because I'm trying to bust some myths that are out there. Um, so is this virus caused by bats? And are there other viruses that were caused by bats? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the, the virus is related to a bat coronavirus and uh, when SARS first happened, it was felt to be related to a bat coronavirus. Um, there was to look at coronaviruses in bats and there's literally hundreds of, of those viruses in bats. Um, what we don't know is what made this uh, get into humans and then transmit so easily. Um, uh, but it, it uh, is related to a bat virus, probably got into some intermediate animal um, that then affected uh, humans. What that animal is, there's some theories, but not been proven. Gotcha. And there's a lot of conspiracies out there, but maybe that's another night. And we may need to do in like an edible or smoke something before that conversation. <laughs> Um, all right, so the next question is, can saline- This was not moderated, this was not moderated for that kind of stuff. I'm just saying. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I take that she back. She thought she was living in Colorado. I thought I was talking to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we are in Madison. Um, can saline nasal spray kill the virus? If you split oh. the okay. Um, what about, I heard aiming a blow dryer, the heat from the blow dryer, if I aim that up the nasal uh, passages or oral areas, the heat will kill the virus. Is that true? Nope, not going to help you. It would need to be so hot you wouldn't have a nose anymore. <laughs> okay. And then we already talked about wearing gloves when we're shopping and why we shouldn't be wearing gloves and just practice really good hand washing. Um, can someone get the flu? and coronavirus at the same time? Theoretically, yes. And, and uh, looking at the data, there are some people that have uh, the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 and uh, another virus. Um, looking at the data at our hospital, um, it's only about one and a half percent, so relatively infrequent. Um, it was seen a little bit more um, in China because there was more flu in the area as well. Um, so it, it can happen, just not very common. Okay. So the next question is, I don't have an N95 mask, and I'm going out with a homemade mask um, that I made, and I know that this mask can't protect me from um, certain viruses, especially this virus, you know, because it, it's porous and it can get through. Why do I have to wear a mask at all? Well, the, the mask does a lot of things. Number one, it, it uh, prevents you from touching your mouth and nose. So it sort of helps protect you there. Um, it does uh, help against droplets uh, coming in. Uh, uh, so it, it does actually help reduce the risk. It doesn't get rid of it completely. Um, th those would be the main uh, two reasons uh, why it's beneficial. Even though it's porous, even the N95 is porous. It's just that it, uh, it's uh, designed so that even tiny things uh, can't get through it. So you do get some degree of filtration from even a, a homemade mask. And then uh, is it true, like maybe I'm an asymptomatic carrier and that will prevent me if I cough or sneeze or something to spread the virus to yeah, help, uh, or, or landing on my apples that I give baths to? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When you're feeding <laughs> the baths. Bat, bat, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, so tell me about what is herd immunity 
And how long do you think it will be before we can um, expect that? Yeah. So herd immunity is when you have enough people that are um, are protected or have antibodies uh, to a, an infection, uh, so it's less likely um, that the that when a person comes into a room or a space that they can transmit it and get a large number of people sick. Um, <clears throat> Typically, uh, you need somewhere between 50 and 70% of the uh, human population uh, with that kind of antibody or a prior exposure uh, mm -hmm. to have herd immunity. And when that happens, uh, it just markedly reduces, um, you know, uh, if a sick person were walking around and everyone's immune, no one's gonna get sick and there's not gonna be a big outbreak. But if only one person is immune and you're in a room of 20, 20 people get sick, they go on and infect other people too. Okay. Okay. And then, um, should healthcare workers self quarantine at home from family members in case they are silent carriers or they've been exposed, but maybe like how so that's how, a loaded question, Michael, because this depends on where I'm sleeping tonight. <laughs> uh, as I say, if, if you want to self isolate, that's your own decisions. <laughs> Um, but the reality is, is uh, it's not actually recommended that uh, uh, people that are healthcare workers <clears throat> uh, self-isolate from other uh, individuals that are healthy. I think if you had uh, an elderly or debilitated person living in your house, if you had a transplant patient uh, in your house, I think you'd want to be extra cautious and maybe try to keep six feet away from that individual. Um, uh, but uh, really, uh, for usual healthcare, the, the way that I look at it is, I'm far, far more worried about catching COVID-19 going to Whole Foods than I am going to the COVID ICU in the hospital. Interesting. It's, uh, you know, everyone's wearing a mask in the hospital. Everyone's being careful with hand hygiene. People are, I think, more thoughtful um, <clears throat> about uh, being safe and covering their cough. You walk into Whole Foods and it's a, you know, everyone's doing whatever they want. You don't have everyone in a mask. Some people are picking up every apple and putting it back down. Uh, I don't know, that's my so, so two things are popping up here on the screen. Can you be influenza A positive in your COVID-19 worst flu of 10 people's lives? Could you have already had that high fever, et cetera? Yeah, so generally it depends on when you, had, when you got sick. If you had it before probably the end of December, beginning of January, it was flu, it wasn't COVID-19 in the United States. Um, if it's been aft after that, it could have been flu. We had a, a late flu season here in the United States, um, or it could have been COVID-19. And again, I think it would depend when you got sick. If it was January, more, more than likely uh, it was flu. If it was last week, it's more likely that you had COVID. Got it. Um, and then we have high risk isn't just 60 plus. Who else does it influence? Cancer, pregnant, chemo, et cetera. Yep. So, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, definitely any underlying medical condition, cancer definitely is associated with a higher risk, uh, including patients getting a recent uh, a chemotherapy. Um, pregnancy, unlike most other viral infections, actually doesn't appear from the data that we have to date um, to, to significantly increase the risk because uh, people are younger when they're pregnant. Um, but uh, unlike flu and other viruses where mortality is higher, um, it actually appears that mortality, if anything, is the same, if not a little lower than uh, 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 non pregnant Okay. So we've had SARS, MERS, H1N1, Ebola. The world didn't shut down for that. Why, for this virus, are we shutting down? Yeah. So I think that for all of those, um, the, uh, you were able to do containment a lot better. Um, so we, we didn't have um, uh, the number of cases uh, uh, spreading in the United States like we did with those prior uh, illnesses. And particularly, you know, if you look at SARS and MERS, um, we didn't shut down in the United States, but Hong Kong shut down for SARS, and much of uh, Saudi Arabia was shut down for a period of time when MERS was uh, uh, first emerging uh, in 2012. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it really, uh, uh, it, it has to be calibrated to what's going on locally and how many cases you're seeing. 
Uh, with both with SARS and MERS, we literally had thousands of cases glo globally, not two million. Got it. With okay. the world shut down. So the All question right. just popped out: Is the mortality rate lower with more testing? That uh, I think the current wisdom is yes. The more people you test, the more minimally or asymptomatic uh, illnesses you'll detect. And what we're really talking about is the case fatality rate, the number of people who die over the number of people who are diagnosed. What we really don't have a good handle on right now is the number of people who are diagnosed. Yeah. And that, that's why a lot of times people will look at mortality rate instead of all positives, but uh, uh, you know maybe of <laughs> patients admitted and diagnosed in the hospital. Mike, will you swim with me in Lake Mendota this summer? <laughs> if, it's warm enough. if it's warm enough. That was dumb. That's, That's definitely Dominic. So All capitals. We're gonna we're gonna wrap things up. We we don't want to bore too many people here. Um, again, thank you, Dan and Mike and Mac. And if anybody's looking for um, healthy home cleaning tips or anything like that, just um, connect with me. I'll let you know what what I'm doing here. And um, thank you for joining us. Yeah. I will certainly uh, down in the comments of uh, this live post. I will throw down. Um, uh, a link over to to Dr. Mike's stuff in Northwestern. I'll throw a link out there for Heal Garden, and of of course, uh, you know, a little website. Or if you want to get to me and Dom on Facebook or Instagram, it'll be easy to find. Um, Dr. Mac, thank you. Dr. Mike, thank you. Thanks. DJ, thank you so much. Yeah. Dom, stay, thank you. Stay well, everybody. Have stay a wonderful, good. wonderful night. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank Bye, you. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank thank you.